knew that fucking door was gonna creak when we began recording. Uh, hey Jim, hand me that thing over there, man. Oh, thank you. I think I'm gonna need yours too, man. Thanks. Dude. Wizard Magazine, number 11. I'll be page turning today. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg, sitting in the passenger seat. Riding shotgun, man. Todd McFarlane cover, Spawn. There's an old adage in uh, professional wrestling, uh, made famous more recently by James E. Cornette. He described that the way things worked in the territory days before WWF, what would the smart play would be to get very popular in a territory, make a big name for yourself, perhaps get a big rivalry going, and this sounds counterintuitive, but you disappear from that territory. You disappear off their TV for six months, for a year maybe. How can you ever miss me if I don't go away? And that's exactly what Toddy Mac, Uncle Todd, the Todd, <laughs> the Todd father did with Spawn. He was, he was away from comics for basically an entire year. Bart Sears took over Wizard. <laughs> Three covers at, uh, at this point. Three covers, and I promised that we would keep a tally going of the Todd McFarlane co covers uh, throughout throughout um, the tenure of our podcast and stuff. So this is, within the first year of Wizard Magazine, this is cover number two for Todd, Todd McFarlane. So I got a little bit more insight into uh, the creation of, of both of these covers, actually. Um, Todd McFarlane is such a big name in comics at this point that he did not draw covers for Wizard. He like this piece here is a piece that Garib commissioned for his father before the magazine was perhaps a year before the magazine was even created. Um, the store that they owned was something like uh, Wizard Cards and Comics. So so Todd added all the accoutrement of uh, your basic Wizard, and that this piece was sitting in in Garib's parents' house for uh, for a year before he got the idea to put the, the magazine together and asked Todd's permission to, uh, to make that the inaugural cover for Wizard Magazine number one. You see some weird design elements that didn't carry over into the Spawn comic, uh, mostly the, the beaded um, circular rivets that are on this armbar piece. They eventually turn into spikes. And let's not even get into, like, where are his legs or whatever in the, <laughs> comp in the composition. Um, but this was just... Uh, a dashed off drawing that Todd did when he was designing the, the costume. Garib presumably asked him to do a cover and Todd was like, print this or nothing, probably. Yeah, and you'd see a lot of Spawn art around this time and a lot of any of these books, you know, any of the new image books, you would see kind of like just figures, you, you know. And they, I love these things, but I think about them now and they're so not necessarily dynamic you know like there's a lot of action on the cape there but there's no foreshortening there's nothing contextual going on like it, it's pretty straightforward i think around uh bishop cover number eight i had the same comment where it's just a guy standing you know basically flat against no background i liked these at the time and maybe it was because this was the level i was able to emulate um but i look at stuff now and i think like as a cover design it's it's there's it's not the most challenging drawing you could come up with. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty basic in hindsight. You get all the McFarlane details and all the fun stuff that you, you know, make, make McFarlane McFarlane. But in terms of a composition, not a lot going on. We have a pretty jam-packed episode today, man, so we'll just get right into the nitty-gritty. Yeah, I like this ad. So we, this ad for Spawn. Yeah, because it's flat color. You know, one of the... I think one of the big things Image does right away is the digital coloring. You know, they really, I think, pushed digital coloring into the into the norm for comic production. But you still see, like, this this style that would have been the common style through the 80s, especially coming out of Marvel, was that flat color. So it's interesting to see this new character, but with that kind of coloring that, that honestly could go back to the 60s. You know, if it weren't for the line art, that kind of coloring approach, that, that Superman, you know, from the golden age forward almost. I really like this this Todd McFarlane inspired logo. Um, you know, you know he put this together because we saw his handiwork in the Overt Kill video when he created the Overt Kill logo. And this logo 
came with the, a lot of spawn ad, ad art before the first issue went to press. When issue one came out, I was so disappointed that this wasn't the logo. I had copied this logo at that point, you know, in my sketchbooks and, and really liked that part that it was like sketchy and looked like something he drew. And whenever I saw the polished logo on the finished comic, it was kind of like disappointing. <laughs> I'm all right with it now, but. So we're just barely getting into the issue and there's already an advertisement for what's coming in the next issue of Wizard Magazine, Wildcats cover by, uh, by Jim Lee. Yeah, I like that they make sure that his name is colored. It's falling outside of the color box, but make no mistake, this is very important information. Just in case if you didn't notice this Jim Lee uh, box right here, calling attention to that issue, Garib Seamus says it about three times in this one sentence. Rule of threes. <laughs> Ernie Bushmiller would approve. It's all plugs. That's what I have in my notes. They're plugging future cards for next issue, Shadowhawk. Um, I think Wolverine card, and then, right, Jim Lee, Jim Lee, Jim Lee, and Ghost Rider after that. So when I'm learning to draw comics or make comics, one thing I would hear about is character design and that your character should stand out in silhouette, be recognizable in silhouette. Batman is the example everybody uses whenever they're showing this thing, right? Because of the pointy cow, very distinct. And what do you do, this ad designer? Let's color that part in and erase his identity. For what reason? I guess there's a story coming up where Batman is unknown or lost. No, 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 it has nothing to do with that. We want to sell Batman books. We just don't want you to know this is a Batman ad. <laughs> Very bad design. No, ne You know, this should be your negative space. Doesn't make sense. Put a moon behind him or something. Eventually, we're going, going to uh, be covering an issue of Wizard magazine that focuses on um, Spawn meets Batman. And with a cover by Todd McFarlane and Frank Miller. And if you look close on that cover, there are two moons. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. <laughs> Letter from the editor, Patrick Daniel O'Neill, uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the plug gets pulled on Impact Comics. Impact was DC's superhero line aimed at kids. So the idea is get new readers through this line. I think it lasts about eight months or something before they pull the plug on it. And this hit close to home because one of my first professional gigs was drawing a new a book for a new line at DC for their Minx line, their young adult books called Plain Janes. Um, the line was in development for several years. They published, I think, one year and then pulled the plug while I was drawing like the third volume of the graphic novel series I was doing. And it really was, I think, two seasons that it, that it lasted. But, you know, that's like 13 months. So... It, it was, uh, you know, they, there was criticism at the time for the same exact thing that DC pulls the plug on this thing before it's really had a chance to establish itself and to, and to find that new audience. And if you're looking for a new audience, you, sh you would expect it would take some time. If it's a new audience, they're not there waiting for you. So you're going to have to kind of work to establish that. And that's what Pat O'Neill is talking about with the impact line going away too quickly, in his opinion. And what happens if we don't bring in those uh, kids? You know, where, where's, where's the next generation of comics fans coming from if there are no comics for them? Patrick Daniel O'Neill, he's imagining that DC is looking at the direct market numbers and that they have like a certain threshold that they want to hit out of the gate. So they're not necessarily looking at the, uh, the, the newsstand numbers, which is where the new readers presumably would be. And um, just from my own experience doing uh, like the Hip Hop Family Tree comic in a, in a monthly way, um, it seems that the common wisdom is that uh, by issue number four, that is basically where the equilibrium is. The retailer has to take a gamble because they have to order these books several months in advance. So they'll order whatever they order on number one. You could imagine that um, issue number two and three is going to be a smaller percentage of that initial order. Uh, maybe issue three is even a smaller percentage than issue two. They see how the, the books uh, react on the stands, and by the time the first book is out, they'll be able to order issue number four. And that number will basically hold steady with slight drops or growth, but if it grows, then you know you have something big on your hands. First big feature, and of course, Garib Shameless gets to hog, hog uh, Todd, Toddy Mac all to himself, man. Spawning a new image. I love the, the punny title. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this, this uh, image printed anywhere else. I don't think it's in the comic. No, I think that's another promotional piece. It feels like one I've seen, but maybe like a cover of Advanced Comics or, you know, who knows what. Like, 
like I said, the promotional art for this stuff would float around. So you'd see it in interviews and, you know, Amazing Heroes or somewhere, maybe in black and white, you know, in one of these other outlets. But yeah, it's a nice piece. This feature is a little bit different than the one that was in issue number one that was very specific about Spider-Man. In fact, there's very little Spider-Man talk in this at all. And there is a little bit of a career career arc to the conversation. So Garib asks Todd how he got started. And Todd very famously mentions how he was pounding pavement and, and sending submissions relentlessly month in, month out, and accumulated hundreds of rejections before he eventually got a call from, I believe it was St Steve Englehart, when he and his wife lived in a trailer. He received this call um, from Steve Englehart to, do, uh, to have the opportunity to do some, some backups in uh, Coyote, beginning with issue number 11. Let me, let me add to the submission thing before we flip this open. Cool. Uh, because that is a story that I remember hearing all the time. That was kind of his mythology, and, and, he, and he did you know, beat that drum a lot. I looked at uh, Wikipedia for something, and it said he, had, he would send 30 to 40 submission packs a month to editors. Keep that in mind, anybody that wants to break in. Like, that is staggering to start with. And then he had over 700 submissions over a year and a half time. You know, if you're not getting what you want, <laughs> are you working that hard? Like, that's... That's what I've been surprised by going back through this and like kind of looking at the minutia of these interviews is McFarlane's focus work ethic. It seems unmatched based on any of the other interviews we've come through. Can we take a look Let's inside of uh, Coyote number 11? Let's take a look at uh, Todd's Juvenalia. What I like a lot is that uh, that they give him that they give him a nice introduction it's like they expect big things from this kid. Todd Orzakowski letterer on that. So Todd uh, would also go on to be the, uh, excuse me, Tom, Tom Orzakowski would also go on to be the letterer of, of Spawn Comics and design the actual logo that is on the cover that, that we associate with Spawn to this day. Great silhouette panel. Really good architecture. Like you, you could, you get the sense that he's, he's, he finally has his opportunity after 700 submissions, so he's going to make the most of it. And That's a great spread. Out of the gate, he's he's trying things. We could we could go through this stuff all day. I don't think he has anything in this issue, but he is represented in issue 13. Look at that man, spawn hands. <laughs> the next thing he mentions, uh, you know, because that was uh, that was a finite opportunity. The next comics that he had a chance to work on were uh, Infinity Incorporated for, for DC Comics under the tutelage of, uh, of Roy Thomas. And in the, in the interview, he, he mentions that Roy Thomas would have kept his clutches. On, he says it in a nice way, but um, Roy Thomas would have worked Todd for 10 years. Like he, he, <laughs> he, liked, he liked what he... He, meaning Roy Thomas, liked what he was receiving from Todd, saw that there was something there, and really kept McFarlane busy as, as much as possible. And then, ultimately, after this series and, uh, Bat and B Batman Year Two, he kind of just quits. And this is going to be a theme of, uh, of the interview, because uh, the thing that I like most about him, and I actually identify with just... The, the strategy I, I try to employ in my situation is like never be comfortable, never get um, complacent. And when he's doing just fine, he will pump the brakes, he will strategize, and then he will make another move that ultimately becomes a big deal for, for him. One thing that stands out, the interviewer asks him about formal training, and he's not a big advocate for formal training, but his background, what he went to school for is graphic design. And I think it shows even in these early pages, you know, with very dynamic page layouts, very inventive, uh, much different than I would anticipate from somebody's first comics. So, you know, I, I assume that's coming from his design background. He's one of the few people in comics, certainly at this time, who said, yeah, learn from comics, learn to draw comics from looking at comics, like being exciting matters way more than drawing a perfectly rendered trash can. Yeah, it's such a great example. And it's it's so hard to argue with whenever it's laid out that way. And yet people criticized him. You know, obviously all the image guys were criticized widely by that 
I don't know if it was a previous generation, but by a more traditional approach, by a, the idea that learn to draw your anatomy better or, you know, the perspective doesn't work, like all the fundamental stuff. But here he is, the most successful guy in comics at this time, saying, no, make it exciting. Who cares about the perfect anatomy? And I love that his example is a garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes over to Marvel, one of the early jobs he got was... Uh, Issue number 60, G.I. Joe. And Larry Hama was not happy with the work that he received from this kid. My favorite thing in the entire issue is the splash page where Law and is this Lieutenant Falcon are talking to each other on walkie talkies 10 feet apart from one another. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also drew issue 61, but the plug got pulled on that. And when you take a look at the final printed issue, it's drawn by, a, I believe, Marshall Rogers. But when S Spider-Man comes out, Spawn comes out, Marvel pulled that those pages out of inventory and put out like a G.I. Joe special number one or something with the Todd McFarlane pages. And it's really fun to go back and compare his pages alongside uh, Marshall Rogers. So wow. there might be an... Ep a there might be an image or two showing up on screen right now to just show, give you guys a comparison. You have to give this guy a comparison. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Pretty early on, he's asked by Garib for whatever reason about style mimics, uh, about people who are copying some of the things that, that he, I guess, innovated. Um, I'm uncomfortable with that word in regards to, to a lot of like the page layout stuff because those things don't work. I, I, I call them experiments. Well, not only that, people have been experimenting with page layout radically, going back to newspaper strips in the 1910s, you know, with, with strips that could be read upside down and right side up. And he deflects a lot of the idea that he invents this stuff and kind of gives credit to previous people and saying, you know, maybe he popularized something or, or gave it a little twist. But then also anybody who's imitating him, first he says he doesn't think a lot of people are, but then he's very, you know, who cares? Let him do something, and if they do it better, more pressure on me. Um, he wrote down something about, you know, if they do something better than him with some technique that he popularized, then he either isn't as creative anymore or he's gotten lazy. <laughs> That's a pretty pretty strong uh, point of view. I love, I, I love that attitude that he doesn't... Um that he doesn't think that there are very many people who are um, kind of cribbing his style. And perhaps at this time, there wasn't. But that would come later. You know, there would be the McFarland imitators down the line. I love self-published comics, as, as Kay Fabers all know. And so uh, I tried to pull out a few that, that reminded me of McFarland. And let's, let me share some of those. Please do. So this is The Anticipator. This is a, uh, a religious hero. You know, there's a lot of ways that people can copy something like Spawn as well. Um, I was asking people for, you know, what books are copies. And I was thinking purely visually, but there are books that copy the ideas of, you know, holy warriors and things like that. So um, this one is, is a Christian superhero who is, like, judging and, and getting redemption. So it's almost the Punisher with a Bible and a, and a sword. Satan Six, this is a Kirby property that was drawn. Well, the cover is Jack Kirby and McFarlane Inks. But it's drawn by uh, Tom, John Cleary. Cleary. Yeah, John Cleary, who would ultimately do some work on Marvel properties, such as Boof. On Todd McFarlane properties. Yes. Boof and the Bruise Crew with, uh, I believe, Bo Smith on writing duties. Yes, <laughs> of course. Yeah, and I like Tom Cleary's stuff. I think it's the most McFarlane, probably, of these books that I pulled. This is Sinja. Fantastic. I don't know how this isn't a continuing series to this day. Yeah, he really That's... has those noodle marks down. Like when you when you try to reverse engineer a McFarlane, um it really is like trying to unlearn riding a bike or something like that because a lot of the stuff that he puts in there doesn't make logical sense, but if you just repetitively use his his little ticks and in and, and Chicken scratch, like it really turns into something. There's a logic to it. It's just that the logic is very hard to reverse engineer. This is another one of those, you know, this Christian iconography mixed in with the uh, the chainsaw vigilante spike <laughs> torture scenes. Um, and some of the later issues of Shadow Slasher may be more McFarlane-esque. Uh, by the way, I have six issues of this book. Hey, good for I don't those know if guys. there's more of them or not, but that's a pretty good run for, you know, a book that looks like this. There's more. <laughs> Indeed, there are. Keep them coming. So, look at this piece right here. Wow. 
That's awesome. Keep them coming, Jimmy. All right. This is Hall of Heroes presents Deadbolt. And I think you can see even on the cover, very McFarlane-esque figure, capes. He describes the way he draws capes, McFarlane, as um, it's not cloth. It's like paper. It's like folded paper. And I thought that that was like an interesting insight. But I mean, that's a, that's, you yeah, can that's, trace that. That's, that's, you know, Sam and Twitch right there. Oh man, that's like, we could probably find this pose. <laughs> and, and it's an alley sequence. Wow. <laughs> this guy, shameless. More Hall of Heroes, same guy. Um, I don't know if this is the same guy or not. It might be Martin. Matthew Martin. Yeah. But I mean, this look at that hair. <laughs> it's all there. This is this is super McFarlane, and and I'll be honest, I love it. And then uh, Arachnus is one that's you, you start to get into tougher territory to decide who's pulling from where. You know, like once you get into the hyper detailed stuff, but. There's some semblance there. You know, the spider character helps connect it to uh, Spider-Man, obviously. Awesome. Thanks for pulling these for, for the kayfabers out there, Jimmy. So we quit Roy Thomas on DC. He quit Spider-Man because he wanted to write his own stuff. And there's just like a certain amount of uh, serendipity that was in the air at the time because Marvel was thinking about adding a new Spider-Man title to their line. Um... Superman had four books coming out on, on, you know, basically a weekly basis. So why not add the, the flagship Marvel character, uh, to, to that sort of pantheon and they approached him. Um, this actually answered some questions because I wondered how the, uh, the Spider-Man Todd McFarlane book came about. Uh, they don't go into great detail about that. I don't have anything about that specifically. They ask him what he prefers doing in the creative process, you know, plotting, scripting, uh, drawing, penciling, inking. And he says inking because that's when he does most of his drawing. Um, and one note I took away from it is in regards to that, he doesn't want to look at it too much. So if you were to do very tight layouts and then do very tight pencils and then go to inking, you're sort of staring at the same material over and over and you lose some of the excitement for it. And I thought that was insightful. You know, um, earlier we have him talking about how he's trying to make kids go, oh, my God. Uh, in terms of generating excitement on the page. And so this is another strategy and probably one that helps with deadlines, quite honestly. But I've heard lots of artists talk about this. And I know from firsthand experience, if I have a drawing, a page that sits on the table for a few days for whatever reason, it does my feelings towards that page do change. You know, that energy level depletes over time. Um, so I think it's interesting to see somebody at the top of their game talking that way. He mentions that he doesn't read very many comic books anymore. He doesn't want to look at other outside influences because he thinks that some of that might creep into to what he's doing and he wants to try to remain as original as possible yeah he says regarding the spider-man stuff for better or worse he tried to make it different probably one of the things that attracts me to his work you know that's why i'm pulling out indie weird self-published books i like that different weird strange something i haven't seen before and it's you know something he's going for he described the spider-man as trying to do a david lynch book <laughs> talk about punching above your own weight class <laughs> he also mentions um you know in regards to spawn and the creation of spawn he created spawn in 81 or 82 something we've heard liefeld talk about having these characters from you know much earlier in his career or in his life and it, he has 12 guys just sitting there 12 other characters uh, todd mcfarland says just sitting there I want to see those. Like, what's up? I th I think, I've been waiting for those 11 books. I think we did see, like, he, these characters started to creep into Spawn. So, the you know, the Violator character, uh, probably the Redeemer character. Like, I think we saw these and know these characters. And, and maybe he was right with choosing Spawn as, like... Could be. The, the big willy of, of the, uh, the crew. He, he says he doesn't have a favorite character, which relates to uh, not reading a lot of comics. You know, like, it, it is very much this professional uh, relationship that he has with comics and making comics. It's the fanboy parts over, you know, like most of these guys, you'll hear them talking about who they love or, you know, something they're enjoying. And with McFarlane, it is eyes on the prize, man. He was always very public too, about letting everybody know that he just got into comics way later than probably the average person of his generation. You know, these kids were reading these comics in grade school when he was about 15, 16, when he, came across his first comic books the thing is you could just tell like he is a bit of an obsessive uh you you see that on the page so when he discovered 
uh, comics, it was a incessant weekly habit that he had to he had to get his fix. So he's not as keen on any particular character. He talks about possible crossovers. Uh, I think the interviewer asks brings up the crossover question. You know, having a big image crossover and. He says it kind of depends on the characters and the story, and he feels like it almost has to be the end of the earth to justify bringing all these super powerful characters together in something. But he could see smaller crossovers, like with uh, Batman or Aliens. He was just talking about how those big, like Unity or like Secret Wars, is just this contrived thing. Like, what is Spider Man doing on another planet? What is Daredevil doing on an alien planet fighting the Beyonder? Doesn't make any goddamn sense. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike Spawn, very grounded in reality. The genesis of Image Comics comes up in conversation, and Garib asks how that came to be. And it turns out that, that Rob Liefeld was the guy who who initially was planning on going on his own to make his own comic. Um, Todd knew about this ahead of time. And once Eric Larson became a part of it, he started to get interested in the idea, too. Come out of retirement. He wanted to, uh, you know, he he made what they call nowadays F.U. money on Spawn with the royalties he got and everything. So when his wife was pregnant and she was about to have a baby, he was going to be able to go off and he had the privilege to just be a dad and, and be there and be present as much as he, he wanted to. Uh, so he didn't, you know, he was happy to sacrifice his, his gig at Marvel for that. But he liked the sound of this idea of a bunch of guys getting together at the top of their game to go off and start a new venture. Collaboration is something that he gets asked about, and he mentions that one of the only people he, on, off the top of his head, that he can imagine wanting to collaborate with would be Frank Miller. And he's not sure how he would go about doing that, but he'd probably commission Frank to do some writing for him, which is ultimately what goes down. I guess spawn number 11, maybe? Yeah. 11 or 13? I know I it's an it's odd 11. number. Yeah, I think, I think it's 11. Um, this is reminiscent of interview in issue one of wizard whenever he's talking about if he comes back to comics it would be you know self-publishing or doing his own thing and now we have some, some foreshadowing of a possible collaboration with miller uh which we all know you know comes to pass someone he's not interested in collaborating with is an editor he says uh he's in no mood to have some 25 year old who's never written or drawn a comic book tell him how to write or draw a comic book I live my life by that sort of thing, man. Like, I am so suspicious of book-learning people who uh, who have no experience in the game, you know, teaching college courses. Like, I want to... If, if I'm taking a class in finances, I want to learn from Warren Buffett. I don't <laughs> want to learn from some guy who's spent his time in academia forever. But I like that a lot. And his his personality comes out really well in this uh, in this interview. And Todd McFarlane clearly suffers no fools. You have to be disagreeable. To, to, have, to have real success, you have to be comfortable with being disagreeable. And you have to be comfortable with ruffling some feathers at times. It's going to come up. And, you know, he just illustrates some of that stuff in the body of this interview. Well, when you're... I, I saw Elon Musk just came out and talked about working 80 to 100 hours a week is what he kind of expects out of, out of his employees. <laughs> and... Uh, McFarlane has been on record talking about that kind of work week. And what you're getting with an editor is the person who's stopping that. You know, they're making you deal with some minutia that the editor wants to talk about, meet about, discuss, redraw, rethink, whatever. You don't have that luxury. Like you're producing, especially back then when guys were producing a monthly book or near monthly book. I'm sure McF the last thing anybody wants to do is make their 80 hour week into an 83 hour week so they can take a couple of meetings with with a guy who clearly McFarlane doesn't need to sell comic books or to make comic books. Can we talk about the ad? I don't have very many more notes for the McFarlane interview. The only other note I have for McFarlane. Yeah. So one other thing, Wizard asks him kind of about where the industry is right now, uh, where it's going. You know, we've, we've seen this question come up because the industry is kind of at this interesting point where they're selling lots of some of these comics, but then DC can't sell a kid's comic. And so the interviewer asks him about it, and he puts a lot of weight on the retailer and says the retailers need to know these books better. They need to know the books, and they need to know the names behind the books. It's not Spider-Man that's going to sell your books. It's a Todd McFarlane Spider-Man that's going to sell your books, and we have empirical data to back up this fact. 
yes. When you think of how many comics are now coming out at this time and, and moving forward, you know, it's it's crazy. Advanced comics, previews, all these distributors, those catalogs are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It really does become important if you're a retailer to figure out like a couple of these books are going to sell and a lot of them aren't. And he's basically putting that responsibility on onto the retailer, or at least saying the retailer needs to take more of that responsibility. So that's probably a fairly controversial point of view. Uh, if you're a retailer, you know, and you're reading these comics magazines to keep up with what's going on, I imagine that's not a popular opinion. One final note that I have for this interview is that Garib is asking about the structure of Spawn and, and some story things like, like, what is Spawn going to be like? And Todd says very specifically that this character could almost even work as a Marvel comic. He's not going to do anything crazy controversial with, with the material. It's something that a kid's going to be able to read. So it's almost like he's, he's saying that he's talking to parents or something while uh, he's giving that answer, just letting everybody know that it's going to be palatable. You know, if a six-year-old could read it, 10-year-old could read it, whatever. It's not, it's, there will be no nudity or, you know, excessive graphic violence, even though, there certainly will be that, and probably <laughs> some of the favorite the favorite stuff that I like about McFarlane's work is that he is really good at drawing stuff that doesn't have hard edges. So like liquid blood, energy, drippy body parts, and stuff like 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 he's awesome at that. And we will see many examples of that in Spawn comics in the future. I do want to circle back though, just to this Chicago Comic Con uh, advertisement. The image founding fathers, including Wills Portacio here, um, they're really pounding the pavement to to promote their new line, and they're the guests of honor. You know, they're the top billing. This this show, I believe, is a very famous show for the overwhelming crowd that came out to meet with them. I think they had to set up tents outside. They had huge queue lines. It was they were nobody was prepared for the amount of people that came to this show because I think this was their first big public appearance post the image announcements and image, you know, starting to dominate all these magazines, you know, the second wizard cover in a row with an image character. We're going to get a third one next month. Um, You know, this was the biggest story in comics and happened relatively quickly, you know, in a couple of months time. So I think the Chicago show is like their big public coming out party. This is called cartoonist kayfabe. It's not called trading card kayfabe. Uh, It's when I saw Skybox International, I gave this article a quick glance, but that's it. Yeah, I have one note here. Don't care. <laughs> I do like seeing Spar. I do too. In the house. Atomic Comics ad, Spar drawing Electra versus Daredevil. This guy just can't be found. Yeah, Every nobody... episode we ask about him, and I do like seeing it. If he has a comic book out there, I want it badly, but he's a mystery. Not much here either. Um, Spawn, his creation, in and out of comics... Um, Just a quick overview about what to expect in the Spawn comic. One thing that I do want to point out, though, is that uh, Image's first project, Youngblood, set a sales record of 600,000 copies at this point. That number goes, that number increases over time when the book goes into a second printing. And in the earlier interview, Todd mentioned that, you know, Rob Liefeld got a, he got a jump on me when uh, he put Youngblood together. But if I would have, if I would have known I would have got my Spawn comic out first. Yeah, I have the final tally for Spawn number one at 1.7 million. I, I don't know exactly how accurate that number is, but give you some some rough idea. They talk about the character here. He makes a deal with the devil, which reminded me of Faust, which is a, a you know, obviously a historical. Looking at story, these black, but... and, looking at these black and white pieces in this way, it looks like those badass metalhead cartoonists. Of, of the black and white boom who would draw that kind of stuff, man. Like, it, it fits in that wheelhouse. That, the difference is that that McFarlane can pay for for top production values. Steve Olive, like, the best colorist of comics at that time, like, he could he could get him to add gloss onto it. But it's as rough and, and uh, chaotic as, like, Tim Vigil. You're exactly right. It's that grimy urban setting, alleys, buildings, bricks, you know, very textural combined with spikes, chains, <laughs> lots of shadows. It's right in the same world as, as a book like Faust, and The Deal with the Devil just made me kind of think of those two. And when I ask people about, you know, what's similar to, to McFarlane and Spawn, Faust is an answer a lot of people came back with. So last issue, 
Pat McCollum writes a two-page uh, piece about Spider-Man's uh, 30th anniversary and his relationship with that. And here he's just he's just giving a more academic uh, overview of Spider-Man. I don't care about this. I'll run through the list of what he, what I pulled out. So he he you know in describing Spider-Man and his success, 30 years top character that's obviously successful, not debatable there. So uh, he describes it as you know relatable to several different ages reading it. Um, girls, he goes through the list of the different uh, women characters, girls he dates, including, you know, Aunt May. Like, there's a lot of women characters in here, part of the relatable quality. Good supporting cast and good rogues gallery. And the rogues gallery is always the key to these superheroes. If you look at Spawn, I think that's probably one of the deficient areas in Spawn. If you look at Superman, I think that's a deficient area. So, you know, somebody like Batman, somebody like Spider-Man, they have the great rogues galleries. And that's way more fun than any of the superheroes. So that was my takeaway from this. You know, if you're trying to model a character, if you're trying to build a character, those are pretty good qualities. Lunch with Marvel Comics. The wizard guys have have a lunch date with Fabian Nicieze and a couple bean counters. Uh, let's see, Skip Dietz, Bruce Costa, sales manager, Lou Banks, director of direct sales. This I I was excited to read this until I started reading it and it's it's really bad. Yeah, there, there's no information in this. You'd think like images is, is is like on fire. Marvel gets a chance to try to capture some of that and they do nothing. They do nothing. This article is Fabian has a couple of wise cracks which this reads like fan fiction. Yeah, it's nonsense. Like here's here's the big takeaways. Expect an X-Men cartoon in September, the big X-Men cartoon, and expect there to be a lot of licensing surrounding that. Video and, games, toys, etc. and so forth. In their words, an avalanche. And they were correct. In fact, it's poor. They go through half, half of the first page bef before they even mention one of their comics. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? And, and the comic that they mentioned, because Garib asks about... Uh, Okay, you did you did Spider Man one big sales, X Force one big sales, X Men one big sales. How are you going to top it? And Fabian says, "We're going to be doing a cable miniseries and Spirits of Vengeance." Yeah, they weren't going to top it. Do you think they knew? Like when you think of the tone of this article, you know, like like if Tom McFarlane shows up and man, he can't talk enough about Spawn and Image and his plans and what's happening and where it came from and what he's drawing and all this stuff. And then you get the Marvel guys, the sales guys, editors, writers in the room, and they say there's a video game coming out and a cartoon. And, uh, oh, you want to know our next big book? Uh, Spirits of Vengeance, a knockoff of some other book that we have. Like, do you think they were looking around going, we're in trouble, guys? What are we doing? <laughs> they were sitting on top of that mountain, and they've been on top of that mountain since the 60s, man. So they very comfortable in the So position. unprepared, though. So unprepared. Like, they have nothing. Their top guys leave, and they got they have nothing. Crazy. That's the Miller art, you know, like all the covers for the first half of the Unity crossover by Frank Miller. So you see how they all fit together. I don't know. I, I loved Miller. These aren't my favorite Miller. <laughs> no, no, we just we don't need to filibuster about that because we have within the the first year of Wizard Magazine issue number eleven, we have the third count it third Hollywood heroes with Andy Mangles talking about Batman Returns. And keep in mind, Andy Mangles did not start writing for Wizard with issue one. So this is like <laughs> every Good other point. issue, there is a Batman Returns article. That has nothing. There's, there's, it's all filibuster. This is my favorite one so far. It's I, terrible. I love that you read it. But it's about Tim Burton, I guess, had written a treatment for Batman in like 85 or something. This is basically that. So all of these articles are just hearsay, practically. They're talking about unproduced screenplays and stuff. At least this one is from Tim Burton. So you get you know some insight into his ideas for Batman and a story of Batman. Not what when it went on in the film, mind you. Not the used screenplay, but just, again, fan fiction, and let me write about it. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Five pages. Palmer's Picks. Tom Palmer Jr. brings us a look at the hysteria of the EC horror and crime comics of the 1950s. Subject matter that's near and dear to my heart, man. I'm a big fan of EC comics. I was thinking of this on the reread. This may have been 
my first insight into EC Comics and this piece of history. That blows my mind, man, because, uh, you know, around this time, Tales from the Crypt TV show was out. Russ Cochran does have newsstand distribution for Tales from the Crypt comics, Haunt of Fear comics, and they're kind of uh, published in these 64 page uh, pamphlets that come sort of ganged up in the back. There's an issue of, like, uh, say, weird fantasy or where science science would be uh, included. So I, I was able to read those comics from a very young age and and, and uh, experience those comics the same way that a kid in 1953 would have experienced those comics. And let me know. Let me let me tell you, they stuck with me. I bet. This is a great article because it traces the history of EC Comics. So EC Comics, you know, at this point, 30 years uh, past the Comics Code, 35 years past the Comics Code, they're kind of this. I don't want to say a footnote. They're a big historical marker in the past of comics, but the way they exist now is in his history books and in reprints. So this gives you the background, which starts with uh, the publisher of EC Comics, Bill Gaines, his father, Max, basically invents the comic book format. He does. He gets some uh, Sunday newspaper comics, binds them together, and gives them some kind of a premium giveaway for some product. And they catch on. People love them. And and slowly but surely, they start showing up on uh, New York City newsstands, and it proliferates from there. And his dad is looking for a you know redeeming qualities, right? He's doing Bible stories and and things that uh, parents would be happy to give their kids. The kids might not be interested in them, but the E in Max Gaines EC Comics stood for educational. <laughs> And then in uh, in true EC fashion, as I like to imagine, now, Max Gaines, he died. And what they say is a boating accident. And it's never elaborated on more than that in anything you read. Personally, I like to think that it was an EC style, like outboard motor, fucking chopped his head off or something like that. But he probably just drowned. It could have been an EC crime style because at the time of his death, he was $100,000 in debt. Interesting. And the, and the company lands on, in the lap of young William Gaines, who wasn't looking forward to that whatsoever and felt an, an insane responsibility to his dad, to the family, gets a hold of EC Comics, educational comics, and he starts making some changes. Some of the early changes he starts making is is pushing the, the, the line into um, romance comics. In the back of those uh, A Moon, A Girl romance comics, they would be um, formatted similarly to the popular EC comics. Four stories drawn by four guys, seven to six to seven pages a piece. And he just tries on a whim to include a horror story in the back of one of those uh, issues. He gave he gave the uh, he gave the strip a host who would turn out to be Crypt Keeper. The rest is history, as they say. Yeah, so those books take off big time. Starts gaining momentum, a lot of letters start coming in, and EC begins publishing the horror line of books, Haunt of Fear, Vault of Horror, and the one that everybody will know is the Tales from the Crypt series of comic books. If you don't know the comics, you, you may have known the, the HBO TV show. Um, the HBO TV show wouldn't just pull story material from uh, the horror books. They also pulled uh, material from uh, the crime books, the suspense stories that they put out. Now, these are starting to pile up, and we're going <laughs> to have to get out of focus. focus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crime suspense stories, look at that classic cover. and Well, that's not that much of a classic cover. Crime suspense stories, shock suspense stories, two other big hits for EC Comics, but this isn't the kind of thing that Bill Gaines and his his editor, Al Feld, Feldstein, were most passionate about. They were a part of science fiction fandom in the early days. Um, it's on record that Bill Gaines was like an insane insomniac, would be up for days. He's on, you know, barbiturates and, and, and speed and all that, which did not help when he was on his, you know, Senate subcommittee hearing, which we will be talking about in a couple minutes. They liked science fiction, so they published two science fiction titles that didn't sell for almost anything, but he had the keys to the castle, they were making money, uh, there were going to be science fiction books. Weird Science and Weird Science Fantasy were a part of, were a part of that uh, new direction, as it was called. 
Now, t- now, Tales from the Crypt is probably one of the most popular uh, vestiges of EC Comics, but the one that has endured over time that's been coming out on a very regular basis, monthly, basically since it became a magazine, Mad started out as a comic book, a very successful comic. Uh, you know, we use the, the word viral now. Uh, it's a trendy term. So imagine that each of the comics that we just showed you are posts on Instagram and you get 10 to 15 likes per per post. But then you put something out there that gets say 10,000 likes, that will be Mad Magazine. Yeah, and one thing about Mad Magazine that struck me as we were preparing for this is it's it really is fan fiction. You know, because they're parroting popular culture trends, movies, other books, you know, all of these different things that are happening in the world around them. I don't think you can do it unless you have a real sincere love of that, whether it's the genre that you're lampooning, the structure that's built on, or the characters themselves. Um, that really came through to me going through these comics again. Is just like, that is a bunch of people that love the source material, even if they maybe don't want to admit that in, in, uh, in, in all the company around them. Harvey Kurtzman was the editor of the Mad Comic, and uh, for my taste, I judge a cartoonist by which, uh, which you know, Russ Cochran, uh, EC, hardcover book sets they have. So you have to have the Harvey Kurtzman edited line. You have to have the Mad, but the, the war books that EC Comics put out, Frontline Combat, and before that was Two-Fisted Tales, some of the most sort of, I don't want to say realistic, but human. They didn't portray all of these guys like G.I. Joe, do-gooders, ki- kill- killing the enemy. These are tragic stories. Yeah, it was a different version of war, you know, and it was the flip side of the satire that you would see in Mad Magazine was the depiction of the enemy as human or the soldier as flawed or scared or struggling in this, in, in you know, in their war theater. It was a very different, um, probably charged with an- anti-patriotic at the time in some cases certainly in these 1950s when these books were coming out man if you weren't with us you must be a commie very challenging material for the time period and the reason that it still exists and is still you know talked about and reprinted and and shown 60 years later now so when mad comes out it's it's tremendously popular and within months there were parodies of of mad comics out there poof and booger and any, <laughs> think of anything you can think one of one word disgusting weirdo <laughs> titles so ec ad- admittedly decided to make their own uh imitation mad comic yeah true publisher you have to jump on the popular trend even if you started it good thing they did in a way too because harvey kurtzman only stuck around uh with ec and mad for about 24 25 issues and al feldstein picked up the slack on the editorial duties of mad magazine and feldstein was the editor for panic so he got some practice in that's a great cover it is a good one (laughs) seemed to arouse a lot of uh, public outcry these comics are becoming more and more popular in those 1950s usurping funny animal comics and uh you know sophomoric child fare yeah and the key if you're doing crime and horror if you want to be more popular you've got to outdo the next guy and so those crimes and that horror depiction gets more and more graphic and lurid and Basically, all the qualities that you think make those comics successful, you're going to accelerate. (laughs) Accelerate they did. And, you know, things, a lot of of gore started showing up on covers. And that probably is what caught the parents' attention. They weren't worried. They weren't looking inside the books, man. But they're seeing right next to the Donald Duck comics that were on the racks. they're, They're seeing a guy holding a woman's head. You don't see her neck but you see a bloody axe and you see a body over yonder. And that was actually the specific, uh, that was actually the specific comic that was brought up when the comics people were called in, fr- in front of uh, the Senate subcommittee hearings after Dr. Frederick Wortham started to pound the pavement and talk about juvenile delinquency and how comics is contributing to juvenile delinquency. This is before the Beatles and Elvis were out. This is before the Doom video game. So they needed to point the finger at something for why their kids were being little hellions. Yeah, and comic books would have been the, uh, the, 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 the front of youth culture. The very early stages of development, as you say, before the Beatles and rock and roll, before television had really gained hold, comic books were the youth culture of that time period. So 
when juvenile delinquency became a, an issue, Frederick Wortham makes, uh, makes a name for himself with his book, Seduction of the Innocent. We had a copy of Seduction of the Innocent in the Homestead Library when I was a little kid, man. Like, it is extremely rare on Amazon. It's probably going for hundreds of dollars. Like, it's never been reprinted or anything like that. There became a very strong anti-comics movement amongst parents, politicians. Uh, you know, it was pretty widespread. There wasn't a lot to, to get that ire. Whenever your kids were, when things were going wrong, comic books were it. You know, there wasn't a lot you could aim at. I have, a, I have a small transcript from the uh, Senate subcommittee hearings where uh, Bill Gaines was, uh, he was there, he was on speed to try to keep his weight down, and he didn't do himself any favors. Can I read a little Please. bit of the transcript? They're called the, uh, the, the Kefauver hearings, I guess. K-E-F-A-U-V-E-R. How would you say that? Kefauver? Yeah, that sounds right. Here's your May 20... May 22nd issue. That It might actually be issue 22. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Do you think this is in good taste? Should one of us read the, the cross-examination here, you, you, in one read? Here, you could be Gaines. <laughs> yes, sir. I do for the cover of a horror comic. A cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding the head a little higher so that the neck could be seen dripping blood from it and moving the body over a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. But, sir... You have blood coming out of her mouth. A little. Here is blood on the axe. I think most adults would be shocked by that. Didn't go good for him after that. And uh, instead of allow, instead of waiting for the government to take control of the situation, the the territory leaders of uh, of the wrestling promotions, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the NWA of the time, <laughs> yeah, the NWA of comics decides to get together. Jack Leibowitz and those guys, and uh, Martin Goodman, and all these guys get into a room, and they decide that they're going to self police. They're going to come up with this thing, which ultimately ends up being the Comics Code Authority, and they're going to um, they're going to decide on on sort of laws and mandates of what is acceptable and what isn't. And guess what, Jim? What, Ed? <laughs> Almost every word that was on the title of an EC comic was banned from publication, banned from receiving the, the, the gold star of the Comics Code Authority, which meant that the comic was then not picked up for major distribution. Yeah, this effectively puts EC's new direction line out of business. So if you're a publisher and you have some very popular comics, how do you circumvent this? When all the other publishers are against you, Jim... What did Bill Gaines decide to do? First, he tried a very tepid line of comics that didn't work. Yeah, piracy. How could you not see a comic like Psychoanalysis hitting with the public? <laughs> Literally talking heads. <laughs> yeah, so he, he switches mad to magazine format to get outside of the comic book code authority. That's hacker culture. That's, circum that's circumventing the system, man, and that is punk rock as hell, and I salute the guy, man. Not only does he turn Mad into a magazine, but it becomes even more successful that way because comics was such a, such a dirt medium to adults, to the wider public, that they wouldn't dare allow themselves to be seen reading a comic book, but a square-shaped uh, magazine, perfectly acceptable. That 3 by 4 ratio is just better than the 2 by 3 ratio. Come on, Ed. <laughs> Heck of an article. I have no more notes for the main body. Tom Palmer uh, gives us some recommended reading for, for further insight and analysis of the, of the entire situation. Book number one, From R to Zap. Harvey Kurtzman, Visual History of Comics. I only recently got this book, and I love it. I highly recommend it with the same fervor that Tom Palmer does. It's basically... It's basically just a, sort of a, detail, a visual history of comics, and the text that you're reading is, is, is Harvey Kurtzman just talking shop, talking about the, the material that he likes. Of course, this is a, a probably Lou Fine. Like, like all these guys loved uh, yeah. Lou Fine back in the day. Yeah, this, this looks like a great book. Reminds me a little bit of Jim Steranko's uh, history of comics. You know, I've never seen it, but it, it goes very current. It goes more current than you would think. Yeah, I'm impressed you know, by that. Harvey, Harvey Kurtzman talking about American Flag and, and really Dark cool. Knight Returns. Like, you got to get your hands on this book if, if, if it's not a part of your library already. A uh, couple other books, Completely Mad. Um, 
Have you read Completely Mad? I never knew of its existence. Me either. I, I'll be, I was very unfamiliar with these recommended reading lists. I've never seen From Ark to Zap. So that's on my list now. But the completely mad, um, you know, history of mad sounds like something that would be fantastic. These all uh, sound interesting to me, man. The Mad World of William Gaines. Like, let me get some more detailed analysis on that guy because I just, I just like him a lot. Yes. I think he's super cool. Um, my Life as a Cartoon is Harvey Kurtzman's autobiography. I never knew that he wrote an autobiography. Me either. Uh, I could highly recommend the Harvey Kurtzman biography done by Bill Shelley for Fantagraphics that recently came out. So I'll just add that little addendum to the piece. I would add the uh, Harvey Kurtzman art book that Dennis Kitchen Abrams. wrote or edited or something a couple of years ago that has reproductions of some of his like breakdowns for these stories, some of the war stories on, you know, like legal document, legal pads and stuff, little scribbles and pencil and seeing the progression. It's a really nice art book and, you know, fe features Harvey Kurtzman. Like, if you want to stare at some artwork for a while, you could do a lot worse. And uh, the complete history of Marvel Comics, five fabulous decades of the world's greatest comics. And I long ago lost my dust jacket. <laughs> For this article, Tom Pomo doesn't mention it, but uh, Harvey Kurtzman did work for, I guess it was probably Timely Comics back in the day. So the work is, hey, look. You're right. And this was what was known as a filler strip. These would be like one-page strips that was an ad wasn't sold, so at the last minute they just had to send the book to the printer and they needed something for this page. Nobody wanted these. This was considered the lowest of the low. And Kurtzman, I think, was doing other stuff around the office. Like, he wasn't a full-time cartoonist at this point, wanted to be. Um, and so they would give him these pages to fill, and he did this ongoing strip called Hey Look, and it has all these kind of, like, formal, you know, him playing with the page. What could you do on a page, essentially? And I, I love this strip, and it's been reprinted several times. You know, you can, you can get an inexpensive copy of this in reprint form. And I always think, like, this is the garbage that nobody wanted 50 years ago, and it's still in print. And whatever books these appeared in, nobody remembers those books. But they remember this piece, this strip that no one else wanted, and Harvey Kurtzman turned into gold. And he was able to, because this was such flotsam and jetsam to Marty Goodman, he got to maintain uh, control, and he owned these strips. My favorite uh, Hey Look strip is uh, a guy wakes up, and he's kind of he's kind of cranky, he's tired, he needs to wake up, he needs some pep in his step, and then his wife... Uh, pours him, pours him, you know, a cup of joe, and he he kicks back, he drinks it, and then he spits it out and says, "Oh, that was ink." <laughs> How great, right? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's breaking the fourth wall already, and this is 1949. Yeah, yeah, I love the idea that you know whatever opportunity you get, you're able to turn that into something. We segue into Brutes and Babes with Bart Sears helming the. Uh, the duties as our teacher in anatomy this go around, man. Specifically, the chest and torso region. Yeah, anatomy was the other staple of every uh, every aspiring cartoonist, right? Trying to figure this out. How do you draw these action figures? Uh, every book I ever looked at had a version of this. So when I was in 10th grade, um, kind of for an independent study, I did a sketchbook that's basically my anatomy reference and anatomy practice. 10th grade. How old are you then? 15, 15 is that? 15, 16, yeah. I was probably 15. This is awesome stuff, man. It's funny because like, I have these little notes. Um, <laughs> never draw limbs straight and stiff. <laughs> you know, like, it's the notes were my favorite part whenever I found this uh, this week. <laughs> I have no idea where they came from either. You know, I was probably looking at anatomy books and how to draw books, and then, you know, like, getting pretty detailed with musculature and even what things are called for just no real reason. There is a reason to it, because, like, this is something that was instilled in our brains, like, at the Kubert School, and and those guys were classic dudes, you know what I'm saying? So so it was like, don't, don't be making muscles up, like, you know, draw this flexor and this blah, blah, blah. Of course, I forgot what all of them were. But we're showing, uh, we're going through this at a more extended clip because uh, what can we say about the Brutes and Babes feature that hasn't already been said? Yeah, you know, like it's even the Latin names for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, man. Thanks for bringing us by. Yeah, I'm not as good at applying it at this stage. Yeah, we're doing. <laughs> and then, of course, having the guy with the gun. <laughs> <laughs> See, man, you could tell that you went to school in the earlier '90s, man, because uh, if you were there around my time, like authorities would have been called for this piece right here. <laughs> oh, jeez! They would have been keeping their eye on you. 
Sad but true. Walk cycle. Not a very good one. <laughs> so hard to do. I can't do it. I can't do it today. Nice, man. So it's just Bart expand, expounding upon the uh, the torso. Yeah, have you heard of this method? The idea of the pillow, you know, the, the pillow being like the four points for your hips and shoulders. So you just imagine a pillow shape in there. Yeah, no, no, pretty cool. But but what he's describing is what they call, uh, uh, is it con contro pasto? Where it's like the idea that like, if you're running, your mm -hmm. left arm and left leg are not coming forward at the same time. It's like the, the balance of the figure. I can't believe there are two columns with Babe in the title and that they're next to each other. We'll skip it. <laughs> Wizard Comic Watch. Uh, Captain America Annual 9 and Captain America 282. Uh... Early appearances of the Nomad character. That's a whiff. <laughs> Secret Wars 8 and Spider-Man 300 are comics to watch out for. Get them while they're cheap. First appearance, black costume Spider-Man. And uh, first full appearance of Venom. A little, a little better uh, pr prediction on that side. Going to call out the amazing artists. Of, of this issue, uh, if you are one of these amazing artists, drop us a comment. Feel free to put some links in the comments. Show us, show off your Deviant Art page or your comics or whatever you're doing creatively. We want to know. I'm going to say Oscar S. did a Predator. Jason Bone did a uh, did a riff on the Fantastic Four number one cover. Rue C. De La Cruz, San Diego, California, drew. His iteration of Thor. I like the color in that one. I do too. Neil Mockford draws a an Eric Larson inspired Rhino figure. John Hack does like a, a Psylocke a Psylocke esque character with a slingshot bikini. Is this is this a reference to an iconic cover? I don't know if it's an iconic. I think it might be from a from a. Uh, trading card yeah i feel like i've seen that somewhere and I i've definitely it. seen it j bone the the often uh inking inking collaborator with guys like mike allred big ups j bone joseph k illustrates a venom eviscerating some some wizard uh cloth <laughs> mark a rise gambit that's a good gambit a great color mark w counts martial law also good <laughs> i'm on board for these Jason Ling illustrates a domino. Christopher Higginson, Lobo's back. Daryl T. Jones illustrates a, a Spider-Man with the wizard garb. Paul Lesh illustrates Magneto. Mike Taylor, age 17. He gets my pick for this issue. Draws Faust eviscerating a wizard. And might I say, why not take this opportunity right now, since Mike Taylor was 17 years old at the time I was reading <laughs> Faust, why not donate to the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund? <laughs> Just in case, you know, some... There's every year, there's some hill, hillbilly mother or there's some goofball politician who's trying to, uh, you know, create a platform for themselves on family values and they try to put a comic shop out of business. Donate to CBLDF. Mark Holder and Brian Miller draw, I guess, their own... Oh, no, that's Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. Yeah. Double lighting on the on the muscles there. <laughs> We salute you guys. Here we go. My Kind of Hero. First time for My Kind of Hero. So these are fan-created characters, complete with their profile, origins, powers. Big fan of this. Shadow Chi, created by Bert Mick Kimura, age 21, and another character called Axe by Anthony Cabrera. We salute you fellas as well. Collecting Comics in the 90s by Patrick McCollum. Only note I have for this is his prediction of a coming comic company war in uh, 92-93 with the idea that there are a few of these upcoming publishers that are trying to take their shots and, and get a piece of that pie chart that we'll see here in a page or two. At this point in time, Marvel Comics has such a hold on the, on the industry. They have about 50% market share and DC is, is losing some ground. So he does make three predictions about new comic companies that 
we need to keep our eyes open for. One of them is Dark Horse, which has really been selling some books recently on the strength of licensed properties. Mm -hmm. Alien, Predator, Terminator. And now they're attracting some big creators like Frank Miller's doing Sin City at the time. They named John Byrne doing Next Men. The next publisher that they mention is Image Comics. And the way Patrick McCollum puts this out there is it is that idea of, you know, selling sizzle and not the steak kind of thing. These are a bunch of the top names in comics who 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 have massive popularity right now, but we don't have much evidence on what it is they can create off the bat. Uh, we've They've seen Youngblood 1, and in terms of story, Pat isn't necessarily fully on board. Very skeptical. So as the drum rolls, Jimmy, what is the number one new comic company <laughs> that Patrick McCollum wants you to keep your eyes peeled for? The most impressive up-and-comer is Valiant. <laughs> Yeah, and they don't mention Tops, which Garib called out last issue as being one of the top three uh, rising companies. But Valiant and Image seem to be pretty consistently viewed this way. And, and Patrick McCollum is putting them ahead of Image Comics for the reasons of meritocracy. Uh, he cites that they are they are just better comics in terms of story and, and writing. But uh, you know as well as I do that life... And business is not a meritocracy. Popularity wins the wins the race always. Fun article, though. Whenever you think about, you know, this is what we have to look forward to as we continue going through Wizard, you're going to see these upstart companies, and not just these couple that we've mentioned, but lots of people will throw their, their hat in the uh, comics publishing ring over the next year or two. Jay-Z has a famous line. I put it down here in my notes. Uh, Dumb down for my audience, double my dollars. <laughs> Wizard News. We'll just go through the ones that matter to us the most, Jimmy. Youngblood sells out, and Spawn will never receive a second printing. Simon Bisley on Dread Rules. I knew you would have these babies. You have much to say about it? Not really. These are mostly uh, anthology titles, so you'll get about an 8 to 10 page story of Bisley. Um, you're already out of the Bisley section at this point, but you you know it's kind of the 2000 AD uh, painted comic style. Uh, we talked about Bisley imitators on past episodes, so in a weird way, that's what you're getting here. You know, you're getting Bisley for a little bit, and then you get a couple of other guys coming in and and batting cleanup. You know, filling out the issues. But he's a. Gr I like his Judge Dredd a lot, so these are pretty fun. At, so after X Men One hits, people are scrambling to to do their best Jim Jim Lee inspired artwork, right? And uh, DC has some new stuff coming along, nothing of which we really care much about, but I just want to point out this Art T-Bear uh, Nightwing image that, at a quick glance, you could mistake that for a piece of Jim Lee art. Very, very early mention of Brian Hitch, probably the first time you're going to see his name in Wizard Magazine, and, and, and so, several years probably before you start to see his big profile, or his profile profile grow to what we think of as Brian Hitch today, or 10 years ago. Star Wars coming to Super Nintendo, probably the th three of the toughest video games on, on the SNES. Tundra to honor Mobius, or as Harlan Ellison calls him, Mwabius. That's probably how you prop properly say it, but I just feel like a <laughs> douchebag saying it that way. So what is, what is it called when Tundra publishes it? Legends of Arzak, the Arzak Gallery. And uh, they're promoting just these single... Talk about end pages, wow. Yeah, right. Now, this is my favorite uh, Mobius work, man. Uh, issue number two, I think, of uh, Heavy Metal has has the silent uh, Arzak story. Is that the first your first encounter with Mobius? No, my first encounter would have been the Silver Surfer Stan Lee miniseries. But it was still very early on. Yeah. Uh, and what did, what is the conceit here? I think we have names. So these are the names of the cartoonists who all have art inside this this book. Aragone, it, it ranges from Sergio Aragones to Jaime Hernandez, to Joe Kubert to Katsuhiro Otomo. Mignola, Mazzucchelli. A lot of good stuff in there. I don't want to go through too much. So another item on the news docket is Eastman and Laird back together. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 50 begins new 13-issue storyline. There it is, doing an, doing an homage to uh, their issue one cover. And 
you know, Eastman and Laird, they put together the Turtles. They only drew the comic together for about the first 11 issues. And, you know, they would do some things like uh, these these little micro-series. Mm -hmm. And then I believe with uh, issue 12, see, here's uh, issue 6 they did together, issue 8 they did together with Dave Sim. But starting with, I believe, issue 11 or 12, they would do Turtles comics individually. So this was a Peter Laird issue, and this was a Kevin Eastman issue. Turtles becomes a thing at this point. This would be 1986. The cartoon is out, and they are being... Uh, Eastman and Laird are now officially businessmen. They are in business, and they are taking meetings, and that is what the bulk of their time is being spent doing. So they started to delegate creative duties. Uh, the, 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 tur the Turtles series is pretty wild. Um, as, I, as I throw them down here, just like take, take them off and like... Yeah, yeah. So... You would see, like, such a wide range of comics from people like, you know, this is Mark Martin, uh, Von, I mean, Mark Baudet. Then it would, like, go right back to Mark Martin. Like, you could, it would get so wild. Yeah, and, you know, painted styles, weird logo variations, pen and ink. Like, it's it's head spinning. Whenever you're a kid trying to sort this out or coming across one of these when you're used to like the cartoon and you're looking for more turtles and you get your hands on this. <laughs> right. So like this is a Michael Zulli piece, part of a trilogy. This is book number 31. So I'll you're these handy. So you're stoked, right? And out comes book 32. It ain't that. <laughs> <laughs> then out comes 33. Color Richard Corbin issue. Such a great issue. This would have been one of the first Color Turtle uh, Mirage issues. Fantastic issue. And there was a video game called Turtles in Time where where uh, I think there's at least a moment where you you play as like the, the, <laughs> the turtle that. eggs with the legs. I might have that a little bit wrong, but like the turtle eggs with the legs. These are so bizarre. They get into pirate fights. There looks like samurai, samurai yeah, armor. Yeah, this is this is the, the third live action movie when they go back to a feudal Japan and stuff like that. They ended up doing like issue 18 to 21 together. It was a story called uh, Return to New York. And then when they get together for the, the, the last like 13 issues, they, they actually didn't work on all of it together. Um, they, they only worked on a small portion. But uh, the first maybe two or three issues, they ended up making some classic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles looking comics. Interesting that Tundra is a thing at this point, too. Yeah, and <clears throat> I don't know how long this 13-issue run goes. Here's why I mention it. By yeah. the end, I think the print runs are so low that they became kind of expensive to buy in the aftermarket, the later issues of yeah. the City of War. And and I assume that had to do with maybe the decline of the direct market. Oh, you know what else? Since we're talking McFarlane, here's his turtle pinup from issue number 50. I think there's a... Uh... Here's an Eric Larson one right here, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will show up in issue two of the regular Savage Dragon series. Good pull. That's all the wizard news I care about this issue. How about you? That's all I have. Keep it rocking. So they're back with the Brat Pack. Kid, the, the last generation of kid comic collectors. <laughs> and their first topic is money. Where, where they get money to buy comics, and how they decide what they're going to buy on a limited budget. Mike gets his money from the bank of mom but the thing that's interesting in this piece to me personally is uh is they talk about how they choose the comics that they buy and it just reminded me of like a very strict rule set that i had for myself when i was a young boy going to the right aid to grab comics so i would look inside the comic on page one if it said part two three whatever of a story it isn't getting bought unless it's x-men <laughs> If, and then I look on the very final page. If it says to be continued, it's not getting bought either. So that pretty much left me with What If by Jim Valentino <laughs> <laughs> as like the comic that I could that I could enjoy that wasn't a part of like a bait and switch that required me to um, buy multiple issues, which I would have been fine with. It's just I could never trust that the next issue would be at the at the drugstore. They complain a little bit about gimmicks and how that drives up the cost. I've complained before about this. Hologram covers, 
stupid cover up the art that I like. I you know I never liked it, and it always just I never gave too much thought to who's buying these or does anybody like it. And so like here we have kids buying books and they're complaining about those gimmicks and they're not really interested in those gimmicks. I'm curious like who was doing that, like who was supporting those to the point that publishers were they were successful. Like, who was buying them? Those had to be the books that people, retailers were buying and then they were stuck with or something. Probably. The Wizard's Crystal Ball by Greg B.S. Who man. He plugs uh, Terror, Inc. number two. We talked about that last last month quite a bit. Um, Jorge Zafino art, you know, definitely go buy Terror, Inc.'s uh, back issues. It didn't appreciate in value, but cool to look at. And then Spirits of Vengeance number one, um, those funny Marvel sells luncheon people talking about their next big hit. This is it. Yeah, this is a uh, speculator article, and he's trying to imagine what the next big selling books are going to be. So the reason why you should grab Spirits of Vengeance is because it's you know it's a second Ghost Rider title, so stores are going to under order this the same way that they did Punisher War Journal, Punisher War Zone, and those books are worth a little something now. And the Terror Incorporated may be worth money someday because it introduces a new character. And I actually remember that when I was a kid, like when you would get a comic that would introduce a new, and a new character and you kind of like would keep that one in a little bit better condition just in case if, you know, it becomes the next Venom. <laughs> Picks from the Wizard's Hat. Spirits of Vengeance number one. They're, they're pushing heavy on that baby. Adam Kubert art. It's worth a look for the art, I, I say, man. It's when Adam had that cute... Fresh from the Kubert school. Uh, yeah, I was a big fan of his stuff. Earlier stuff, rather. I like most of these guys when they're a little rougher, less polished. Uh, and, no, you know, no exception, I enjoyed his stuff. He did some Wolverine. I think Andy did, too. He did some Hulk. So Eric Larson's Dragon is now known as Savage Dragon. And it is the third effort from Image Press from Malibu Comics. This was the title I was least interested in whenever all of these guys, uh, you know, when like the big image announcement was made and everybody was talking about their titles, Savage Dragon was the one I had the least interest in. By the time I finished issue one, it was my favorite book for the next probably two years. It's amazing how how well that worked on, on me as well. Like just with like the, 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 the pathos of it, like the entire three issue miniseries is, is the best of like all those miniseries. And I was buying into everything. I was buying into the mystery of the dragon. I was buying into, you remember there was a, there was a character that was like kept in a basement mm -hmm. and, and in shadow. I was buying, I was, I felt for that character, man. It broke my heart. <laughs> uh, I was, I was fully on board. He had like the great cast of characters. There were always colorful characters, villains that dragon was fighting, possibly allies that he'd be teaming up with. And the format for, for these would always be like, two pa the first two-page spread would be a big image of him usually punching somebody or getting punched, but like a big action piece with, with a cool-looking character, like Cutthroat, who had like a guillotine for an arm. You know, it just, it hit everything I wanted in a comic. Colorful characters, super action dynamic, dragon out of personality. I think, I think Eric Larson was the best writer of this group, and maybe had the best knowledge of his characters and his world and was just ready to go. And it, and it hit the ground running, you know, like that was one of the things we mentioned about Youngblood is you've got all these characters in this kind of big concept, hard to establish in 20 pages. Conversely, Savage Dragon, they don't get into any real origin. They just kind of hit the ground running. You know, he was found in a burning lot or something, just woke up with amnesia and the story kind of, that's, that's it. That's as much as you get about his background at this time. But it worked, man. It, it made me a believer, and I was not excited for this comic when it. When I was when I saw this listed in in real time in this magazine, was not impressed. <laughs> I was wrong. Unity number one, drawn by Barry Windsor Smith, written by Jim Shooter. I do have a couple of number ones. This issue's number ones. What do you got for me, Jimmy? Totally rad tales. Yes. Who puts this out? This is like a. It's Harvey Comics, sort of, but it's like Lauren Harvey, but these are reprints of Harvey Comics, so you get a Kirby story. Um, this was a reprint from Black Cat Mystery, which was like one of their, you know, horror sci-fi type stories. This is the story why this book, why you want it, uh, especially if you can get it for a quarter like I did. 
This is called 20th Century Man. And what happens is this guy just starts talking to essentially the reader in a very calm, measured tone. And he starts talking about what happens if the electricity goes off and these machines stop working. And he goes through this scenario, painting a picture about how dependent the 20th Century Man is on this technology and on these machines and what would happen if they stopped working. It's amazing it, because it's super calm. He just has this talk and the people around him are like, shut up, man, what are you talking about? But mostly he's talking to the reader. It's this weird you, second person. You know, it's very much like this calm, like, hey, I'm going to ask you something, guy that's reading this comic, kid that's reading this comic. <laughs> and it's it's this slow burn. Fantastic. Do we know the artist? Is it Ogden Whitney or somebody? It's not. Um I, I don't know the artist. I, I looked it up, and it wasn't somebody I recognized. Mort Meskin is in this book. That's not him. Uh, you know, and Kirby is in that first story. That that first Kirby story is pretty good, too. It's about an interdimensional travel, traveler that shows up, and, of course, scientists, and everybody gets around him. Is this is Dicko? Mort Meskin. Oh, okay. Um, or, or George Russo's, or possibly those two working together. The Kirby story, though, is about this interdimensional traveler who finally gets frustrated with the poking and prodding and inability of man to sort of like be peaceful and, and recognize, hey, here here's a visitor and here's possibly progress for us. And finally, out of frustration, wipes himself, says he pities humans that they're so stuck in three dimension, and then wipes himself out in front of them, freaking them out. And he just goes back to his people then. But it's it's a really cool story. Looks cool. I think Joe Simon is a collaborator on this. And another number one the Best of North Star, so the Chicago-based horror publisher that we've talked about several times. With uh, some heavy hitters here, man. Vince Locke, Tim Vigil, James O'Barr. Yeah. Kelly Jones cover. Not sure why they didn't lead with one of those guys, but... <laughs> this guy probably knows a North Star guy. <laughs> It's funny, we just saw previous to this, Kelly Jones listed for his next Batman graphic novel following Red Rain. So he had already been doing significant Batman work. This is James O'Barr for fans of The Crow. You know, much lesser seen work, but... And that's why you grabbed this, because most people just know his Crow stuff. I don't, I, I don't imagine that he did much more. This is your Crow. Vigil, Tim Vigil here. You could tell by that. Yes. <laughs> Tim Vigil wasn't playing, man. I just saw a bunch of uh, commissions that he drew where it's like Ant-Man coming out of, like, crawling out of urethras and sitting on top <laughs> of women's hard nipples. <laughs> he is not playing around. There's really only one thing that ne needs to be said when we look at the top 100 books of May 1992. Usurping long-established brands, comic companies that have been around at this point for 50 years or better... Spawn, number one, a months old company, outsold everything. Shots fired. If you're if you're an executive at one of these companies at Marvel or DC, you have to be feeling this. A brand new company shows up and takes the number one spot. Another shocking thing of note is that uh, DC, for the first time in a while, has has two books in the top ten. Marvel has to be nervous. <laughs> changes in the air i'd be nervous after reading that stupid lunch article they wrote man <laughs> it just sounds like bobo the clown is running that company this is brian cunningham's toying around article and he's trying to write previous wrongs where you and i lambasted him for for <laughs> uh for for propagating the fiction of the boba fett uh the boba fett with the uh rocket pack that fires so he's he's putting it out there that you know maybe these things did not reach the wider public uh, if you have one, or if you know anybody who does, send it. Send us some pics. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just Star Wars reminiscing. Uh, you know, which is fine. Like what you like, but it's not one of his better articles. At least it didn't entertain me. The create your own figure department. We answered a question from last week. Did the background uh, right. was the background designed by the uh, person who took the photo? And it's clearly uh, uh, it's clearly a design choice of Wizard Magazine Man Thing figure. Brian Cunningham is putting it out there to the future figure customizers. Please, we need to know what the recipe is for how you achieve these these masterworks. Yeah, what figures underneath this man thing slime? We'll never know. Top 10, Harbinger 1, Unity 1 are showing up on the list. Carnage has two books in the top 10 and he's not and he was removed from the top 10 heroes and villains list this month. Come on, top 10 uh 
comic book and, and hero and villain writers get together. <laughs> Wizard Market Watch. The thing that jumps out at me first, though, is the Wizards' top 10 hottest artists. We have number one, McFarlane, two, Jim Lee, three, Rob Liefeld, four, Ron Lim, five, Wills Portacio, six, Mark Bagley, seven, Eric Larson, eight, John Byrne, nine, Sam Keith, ten, Mike Zek with his goddamn Deathstroke covers. Wizard Market Watch, talking about the success of Youngblood number one, which at this point is selling uh, over 600,000 copies. Um, right at this very moment, Spawn number one has sold over 800,000. You said it goes on to sell about one point what? Seven million. 1.7 million copies. So it's, it still has a million to go. Here's what stood out for me. And I thought this is where you're going. It is where I'm going, but no, go ahead. The, the Youngblood announced is the Youngblood miniseries, whenever it's finished, will be sold in packs at Walmart. Walmart getting in on uh, everybody thought DC was the beginning of the Walmart comics deals, but uh, turns out it was a little bit earlier. This month's big, this month's big movers, Amazing Spider-Man two seven two seventy four, went from four dollars fifty cents to seven bucks. Amazing Spider-Man Special Five went from fifty to seventy five dollars, and Dark Horse presents twenty four. I guess it's maybe an early appearance of Alien or something. It's uh, went from eighteen dollars to twenty five dollars. That's shocking to me. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't know why that is. It must be alien related. Photo of Jim Shooter in that Valiant bullpen, giving a thumbs up. It's probably a big ass thumb, <laughs> like a bull, like a bowling pin. This is the part where we see how well our new mutants number eighty sevens are tracking on the charts, holding steady at seventy eight dollars. Same with new mutants number ninety eight at eight bucks. Shows and conventions. We always like to take a look to see what's happening in. In Pennsylvania, more specifically Western PA, the Pittsburgh region, some reality comic book convention, Green, Green, Shoot, Green Tree Marriott, just a touch before my time, Jim. Yeah, I was trying to think if I've ever been to a show at the Marriott, and I, I don't think I have. Wizard Magic Words, nothing, nothing jumped out to me. How about you, Jim? This is the beginning of Iron Man versus X Men. Uh oh. I think we've all been waiting for this. Well, I guess it goes two pages, but a, a reader writes in. Because uh, he had talked about Iron Man being very tough. And this reader takes exception to that. He's a big X-Men fan and does not like the idea that Iron Man is tougher than the X-Men. <laughs> so they give the column back to, quote, the guy who insulted the X-Men. It's a shame they run this over two pages. <laughs> and he breaks down how powerful Iron Man is. And sorry, that's just what would happen if Iron Man and X-Men fought. No reason to get emotional about it. So, <laughs> so who's trolling who? Is the letter writer trolling the editor, or is the editor trolling the letter writer, or are they both passionately in belief of these <laughs> virtues and points that they're trying to make? This is full-on wrestling promo from the editor side of things. I don't know if it's legit or not, but man, he leans into it, <laughs> and it's just the beginning. I love it because this is before my time, and when you and I were talking about doing this show. You mentioned this as being a favorite bit of yours in the letters column, and it's something that I knew nothing about. Well, let me read a little bit of it here. And for your information, Iron Man was popular decades before you little mutant-worshipping maggots ever heard of the X-Men. <laughs> People have forgotten what it means to be a cool character because some other books have flashy art and half-naked women in them. So you and your butt can just chill, Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. You know these guys are just like in, in, in the offices clowning like homunculus douchebags. Or in my fantasy, there is a Super Iron Man fan in the office and they're clowning him. <laughs> you know, I've been making books for 15 years and uh, I like to hand letter everything. And I usually hand letter the indicias on my books and stuff like that. And I pay attention to to that material on other books. And I would always see this like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 1, 0. And before I did uh, X-Men Grand Design, the first the first big one, and I, you know, hand lettered that, they wanted me to to write this 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then I like, I was just curious, why, what the heck is this? And it's indicative of uh, what the, the, the print number. And it's yeah. something I never knew before last year. Because you would reprint it at the printer by just putting a piece of tape over the number, you know, so you didn't have to generate any new film. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's cool. I was happy that, to, to just see that in there. I would read the Indicia, too, because 
pre-internet. I'd just read everything, backs of cereal boxes, you name it, I'd read it. And uh, the Max always had the best indicia. He would always write like crazy shit. Like there was practically another story going on in the Max indicia. And then Eric Larson and Savage Dragon would always uh, bust Josh Icorn's balls somewhere in the credits <laughs> in DC of pages. So nowadays, we, we all are sort of very well aware of how San Diego Comic-Con, they put out waves of announcements of who is going to show up at San Diego Comic-Con of this year. But before the internet, what they would have to do is put out months worth of advertisements to slowly let people know who was going to show up at the festival. So last year, I mean, uh, last issue, an issue or two ago, we ran down some names of people who were going to show up at the 1992 San Diego Comic-Con, and we have some new names here. Uh, John Byrne, Mark Bagley, Frank Miller, we said Clive Barker before, Kevin Eastman, Wrightson, Chris Claremont's going to be there, uh, Jack Kirby, Eisner, Julie Schwartz, Stan Lee, Bill Griffith will be there, Gilbert Shelton, Diane Newman, Italian artist, Milo Manera, and uh, we mentioned Harry Housen before, too. So a couple of new names hit the uh, San Diego comic book comic convention at uh, in 1992. I believe this is the second piece of David Chun mm. uh, art. I, I remember saying his name before on an earlier episode, I, I believe. That's a hell of an envelope art. Gambit. Brian uh, Corner drew Ghost Rider for his... His envelope art. I like his Ghost Rider hair. <laughs> yeah, it's like the guy from the Forever People. Al Mindy. Talk about hair. <laughs> Look at that Lobo hair. He looks like Nelson. Remember Nelson? The blonde dude. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pablo uh, Almonte does like a Jim Lee-ish Wolverine. And that wraps up issue number 11 of Wizard Magazine. Nice full color image of uh, Wildcats on this previews cover i just passed up this previews for 50 cents two days ago shame on you <laughs> now i'm regretting it it would have been fun <laughs> to drop it right there all right thanks for watching everybody hit the like button uh subscribe if you haven't follow us you know cartoonist kayfabe is available on all the social media that that you like twitter instagram facebook you can also follow us on all those places you can find me at jim rug art I'm at Ed Piscor. All the links are in the description below, along with a lot of other supplemental material, um, links to point you to other YouTube videos of interesting interviews and stuff like that. There, there will definitely be uh, some some more ex expanded um, Todd McFarlane videos uh, at the links below. And uh, we're out.